Hey, what's going on everyone? This is Beck Brace. Welcome to the MongoDB Crash Course. This course will give you great understanding of MongoDB concepts needed to create and deploy NoSQL database. And this is for everyone who is willing to learn MongoDB in simple and easy way. We'll take a look to a few slides first where I will explain the main concepts of MongoDB. Then we will jump to the installation of MongoDB, Mongo Compass and the shell. And finally, we will practice some of the most important commands and queries that you can use in MongoDB. Now, I will be using an IDE called Data Grip, and I'll tell you why later. But you can run the same thing on your Mongo shell, and I will show you everything in a bit. The prerequisites in order to follow along is that you should have at least the basic understanding of what is SQL and what is no SQL systems. The difference between traditional relational databases versus document-oriented databases such as MongoDB. At least the very basics. And if not, then don't worry. I'm going to try in this video to fill any knowledge gaps that you might have in this regard. So by the end of this course, you will feel more confident than before when it comes to NoSQL in general and MongoDB in particular. So what is MongoDB? MongoDB is a non-structured database management system. And if you're aware of SQL, which stands for Structured Query Language, this is a relational database management system where everything consists of databases. Inside them, there are some tables. Each table has a primary key and foreign key. They're all connected and related together. You can run your queries between tables and you can get the result. This is not the case in MongoDB. It's a non-structured database management system. At least this is what you should know for the moment. It's a cross-platform, which means it works on different operating systems such as Mac, Windows or Linux. Document-oriented database means that it's working on a document system. And document is the equivalent of a row inside a table in SQL or in relational database systems. Also, it provides high performance, availability and easy scalability. And we have covered these points in the other video where I talked about the main differences between SQL and NoSQL. So make sure to check that video out. There is no one master computer in the middle where everything is concentrated. But instead, there are multiple replicas with copies of the same database everywhere. And therefore, you can get a high performance without blocking. Also availability, which means that it can run on the cloud, so it can be deployed everywhere in the world and you can have your team scattered all over the globe. And easy scalability means that it can be horizontally scaled. MongoDB works on the concept of collection and document instead of table and row. A collection in MongoDB is similar to a table in SQL and a document in MongoDB is similar to a row or record or tuple, you might hear me saying tuple as well. All these words have the same meaning and these are only in SQL. Now, what about the database structure? Well, database in MongoDB is some sort of a container for collections. So you can see here that we have one main database and we have multiple collections and each collection can have one or multiple documents. So each collection can have one document or an amount of documents depends on you and how you want to design your database. So to recap quickly, guys, collection is a group of MongoDB documents, and it's the equivalent of a table in a relational database system. A collection exists within a single database. Collections do not enforce a schema. It's basically schemaless. So you don't have to design it ahead, like in SQL system where you have a table, you need to have your rows and columns designed ahead. Uh, you need to know what kind of attributes you want to put, what the primary key is going to be, what the foreign key is going to be. This doesn't exist in MongoDB. So it doesn't have a schema or a schema list. But even this is not entirely accurate because even documents within the collection can have different fields. For example, you have um, an ID here and this is auto generated by MongoDB. This is an object ID with 12 bytes character. You have title, you have description, by. You can have actually embedded documents inside other documents or just independent documents and we can refer to them um, in our main document. Okay, so we can refer. So let's say, for instance, that we have a document in collection three, and we want to refer to that document, we will refer to it by the object ID. So 
it's not entirely schemaless. Also, you might have noticed that a document is a set of key value pairs and documents have dynamic schemas. And what I mean by dynamic schemas is that the document in the same collection don't need to have the same structure. So if we will compare between relational database management systems and MongoDB, we can see clearly that there are some differences. So the databases are the same primary key at the bottom are the same. In RDBMS or SQL systems, we have a table consists of rows and columns. In the NoSQL system, we have collections. We don't have tables. This is the equivalent of table. Also in SQL, we have rows or records or doubles. In NoSQL, we have only documents. In SQL systems, we have columns or fields or attributes. All these have the same meaning. In non-RDBMS or NoSQL systems, we have fields. So the field is the key in that key value pair system. But let's take a closer look to a document. Let me give you an example of how a document which is analogous to a record in SQL database may look like. This is just an example for a document of a blog post. So we have here this underscore ID, which is a 12 bytes number that assures the uniqueness of every document. So this is a unique identifier for each document. Actually, it plays the same role as a primary key in SQL systems. We have a title, we have a description by can have URL, you can have tags and tags can be set to an array. We can have an integer. So we have varchar or um, strings. We can have integers. We can have embedded documents as I showed you. So we said that we can have separate documents and we can refer to them or we can have embedded documents inside our document. All right. So everything here is in JSON like format. I refer to it as JSON format. So what MongoDB actually does is that it takes this document in JSON like format and it compiles it to zeros and ones to BSON or binary JSON in order to compile it and understand it. So let's check out the advantages of working with MongoDB. As we said, it's schemaless. We can have different documents. The number of fields, the content and document size are really flexible. We can have deep query abilities, um, dynamic queries on documents. And we will see that in a bit when we'll start practicing ease of scale out horizontal scaling as opposed to vertical scaling in SQL systems. Mapping to database objects not needed, so we don't need any object relational mappers. Also, it uses the internal memory, so it's really good. It's really efficient because the reading time from the memory is faster than reading from the hard drive. Why do we use MongoDB? Well, because document oriented storage, it has a JSON like format. We have read replicas, one computer with the original database system. And we can have uh, on the same table or horizontally different computers with cheap um, equipment, really not very high standard that can have copy from that original database. And they are highly available because it can be through the cloud, as we said. Also, we don't have any complex joins. We can have embedded documents or reference documents. So we don't do the joins like we would do in SQL systems. Also, we can have rich queries and we will see that when we will practice. And MongoDB also has auto sharding, which is analogous to partitioning in SQL systems. So where to use MongoDB? Big data is one big field. Um, as we said before, 90% of the data on the internet were only produced in the last two years. Also in data hubs, content management and delivery, in mobile and social infrastructure and user data management. Now, in terms of relationships in MongoDB, relationships represent how various documents are related to each other. And as I showed you before, we can have one document and we can have independent documents. So, I mean, we can have two independent documents in two different collections or two different tables. Um, the way we can connect both documents together is either by referencing or by embedding. So here we can see that we have embedded this document with building, pin code, city and state here in the same document. So we used this uh, code or this query db.users. db is the database, users is the collection, and we access a method called insert. 
So we want to insert everything together. And when we will find or when we will retrieve the data that we have stored, you will find that everything has been stored in one single document. So the main advantage of embedding one document inside another document that it maintains all the related data in a single document, which makes it easy to retrieve and maintain, right? Instead of jumping back and forth between different tables, you can have all the data in one single document. So the last three slides, I would like to show you some interesting facts about uh, MongoDB. So you can see here that MongoDB is on the fifth uh, position after MySQL, PostgreSQL, Microsoft SQL Server, SQL Lite, and MongoDB is in the fifth position. Okay, this is a survey for Stack Overflow for 2020. Also, MongoDB is ranked the first for the most wanted database system in the market. So if you're a software engineer or a backend developer, full stack developer, knowing and understanding and practicing MongoDB is a must. So the last slide in the presentation is the customers. So more than 26,800 customers have chosen MongoDB. And the reason is obvious because of everything that we have said in the presentation so far. And I work with SAP on a daily basis. And I didn't know that it's using MongoDB as its primary database system. Also, you have AstraZeneca, KPMG, you have EA Sports. And this was very surprising to me. I thought they're working with just traditional databases with rows and columns. eBay, Facebook, Google, Thermo Fisher, Barclays, Cisco. Uh, you have also a Bank of Scotland, UK government. So you have very reputable, great corporations really depending on MongoDB in their database management system. All right. So this was the last slide. Now let's go ahead and start coding in the Mongo shell. But before that, let me show you in MongoDB website how to install Mongo, how to install the shell and compass. And then we'll start working with Mongo shell. All right, so let's do it. Welcome back. In order to download and install MongoDB, Mongo Shell, and Mongo Compass, you will need to have an account on mongodb.com. So to do that, you just click on start free. So the website is mongodb.com. And you can fill here your company if you have a company, also your work email, first name, last name, and password. Once you do that, you will be redirected to the home page of MongoDB Atlas. All right, so I have already an account. Um, I can sign in directly. Notice here in the middle, create a cluster. Choose your cloud provider region and specs. So your cluster basically will be responsible of maintaining your database on the cloud. Okay, you can run your database on the cloud, run your queries, um, having your everything, basically MongoDB, you can have it on the cloud through that cluster. So we will build the cluster later. But what I want to show you is how to download the software. So we can log out now for the moment. And we can go to mongodb.com. And you can go to software, community server, not the enterprise, but community, you have also developer tools, compass, ops manager, connectors, click on community server. All right, so you will need to download that. This is uh, what MongoDB offers. So it offers here the community server version of the distributed document database. Once you download that, we can go to tools. So you will need to download Mongo shell and compass. Mongo, MongoDB compass is a GUI interface. So this is a GUI for MongoDB that allows you to make smarter decisions about document structure, right? Commercial subscriptions include, all right. What we're interested in really in this course is the MongoDB shell. So go ahead and download that. It's a Microsoft installer. And this is only for Windows 64. Uh, we have here Red Hat, Mac OS, Ubuntu. Okay, so choose your system and download the installer, download the package. Okay, and the installation is very straightforward. Once you downloaded everything successfully, go and open your terminal or your command prompt. In my case, as I'm using Windows operating system, I have my command prompt. And go ahead and say mongo dash dash version. 
If you will get this, then MongoDB is successfully installed on your machine. Okay, so you have the version, the get version, modules, allocator, environment. So you have Windows system with x86 architecture. All right, now I'm going to use a software called DataGrip, which is one of the many software products created by JetBrains. Um, let me show you the website real quick. All right, and you might know IntelliJ, for example. So this is DataGrip. Um, enjoy working with databases. So different databases and only one system. So you can run on that, everything that you can imagine. PostgreSQL, MySQL, Oracle, IBM DB2, MongoDB, all right, Cassandra, MariaDB, SQLite 3, all right. So all of the SQL systems that you can think of, you will find them supported in DataGrip. Okay, it's, it's a very nice IDE. You might know IntelliJ, which is very popular IDE for Java. Let me show you. Uh, solution developer tools there you go so you have here IntelliJ this is for Java PHP storm for PHP Golang for Go language this is our data grip PyCharm for Python RubyMine for Ruby you can download it for a 30 days free trial or you can buy a license for it so in my case I have the complete version but Believe me, the same thing will work on your shell. So let me just grab um, data grip here. Let me just minimize this one, bring it here, and we'll have our shell here. So one very important thing before we get started, you need to connect to MongoDB server. In order to do that, just type MongoD. All right, now you are connected. To check out if you're connected or not, just run Mongo or Mongo SH. They're the same. And you should be connected and ready to run your queries. So what we're going to do here will be the same exact thing here. Because I'm going to uh, write queries with um, curly braces and JSON formats, it's not very convenient to do that in the shell. That's why I decided to do it in data grip. All right, so this is MongoDB Compass, and we should be able to see all of our databases with the collections, and documents, and everything. Now we can connect. So here you can connect locally or on the cloud. In order to log in locally, you can type mongodb colon slash slash localhost port 27017. This is the port for MongoDB. And let's see if it will listen on the port successfully and we are connected locally. Okay, so for now we have uh, these three databases. This one I've just created just to show you what we can do and we'll create other databases so don't worry uh, sample database we have one collection all right so the collection has no data or the collection has no documents you can import data if you want okay so from json format or csv format all right you can have your file you can browse and select your file and import all of your data but we don't have that now let's just keep this open and I'll just put it there all right so let's check out what databases we have so far so to do that you can type show DBS all right you can do the same thing here in the console in in the in the shell show DBS and we have admin config and local these databases created by MongoDB. This one I just created. It's just taking uh, a little bit of time. And finally, all right, so basically we have the same result. So this is to show databases. You can also choose an existing database. So let's say that we want to choose sample database. What we can do, we can type use sample database. All right, and you see here, switch to DB sample database. I'll show you also here. I'm not going to do this for everything, but 
just uh, in the beginning to show you that basically everything is the same. Uh, what's working here is the same as here, no difference. Um, sample data database, switch to DB sample database. Okay, uh, we can show collections in the existing database. So to do that, we can type show collections. So we have one collection, which is sample. All right, same thing. Also, we can delete a database. So in order to delete a database totally, we can say, so I will do it here in the shell. You can type simply db.drop database. All right, so sample database is dropped or is deleted. So to create a database, uh, we use the same command as choosing a database. So it's the same command, use. So let's call it, for instance, new DB. So we have created a new database called new DB. So let's check that out. And for the moment, we don't have anything, although it exists, but because we don't have any collections, that's why it's not shown. All right, so here also the same thing. But just to show you which database we are in for the moment, you can type DB. And there it is. All right, so let's go ahead and create a new collection. So we can say db.create collection like that. And we will have a collection of clients. All right, good. With the green check mark here means that operation is successful. And now if we will display all databases again, we will have our new DB shown in the list. All right, so this is for creating a new database to show the collections in a database. All right, this is to switch or to choose a database. This self-explanatory, I don't need to type anything, just to show databases, all right? DB, um, this here, to show which database we are currently in. And here, to create collections. All right, so our collection doesn't have any documents. So let's try to insert a document in our client's collection. We will take our database and we will access the client's collection. And we want to say insert in order to insert whatever document inside that collection. And we'll open parentheses and we'll open curly braces. And here we can define any sort of fields that we want, basically. Um, so we can have an ID, we give it zero. We can have a company, our company name. We can call it La Sosta, for example. We can have an address. We can say 23 Lost Street, New York City. Um, we can have also overdue invoices. We can give that, let's say, 24, doesn't matter. Uh, we can have an array. So let's have an array of products. And let's have coffee and sugar. All right. Let's have date, which is date type to display the current date. We can have also contacts, which can be a second document inside the main document. All right, so contacts. Um, contacts is going to be set to another JSON type. So name is set to, let's say, Jim Neal, um, position owner. And finally, let's give him a phone number. So let's say 555. Double zero, double one. All right, and that's it. 
uh, just the comma like organize this a little bit okay that's better all right and let's hit enter and it was successful now let's take a look to what we have so far so we can say so this is to query the data in order to find the data actually so we'll say db.clients.find and everything is displayed here so i'll make this a little bit bigger for you guys to see so we have an id this is auto generated as we said this is mongodb takes care of this we have an address a company name contacts uh, so inside contacts we have um, the name position um, and the phone number all right we have a date we have an id that we have defined here above also, we have overdue invoices, 24, and products. Okay, so everything is sorted very neatly and nicely here. And the same thing exactly will go if you're coding with me, if you're doing the same thing on the shell. Let's go ahead and do that together. Uh, db.clients.find. So I need to use new db. All right, now we can use the same command. So there you go. So we have an auto-generated ID, the ID that we have defined, the company address, overdue invoice, everything. All right, everything that we have entered, we have the same exact result. Okay, so you should have this. So now you know how to insert a document, how to query a document. Now let's check out if we want to delete a document. So if we want to delete a document, we can do that very easily by saying db.clients.remove and we'll remove using a unique identifier. Um, try to avoid using something that might be uh, redundant in different, um, in different records or different documents uh, because it's not a good idea to do that. So the best practice is to take the ID that we have created here, the ID zero. This is the criteria based on which you can delete a document or a data. So we can open curly braces, we can say ID zero. So I want to remove the document with which the ID is equal to zero. All right, and let's run the query. And boom. So you don't have anything. So if we will um, run this again you will not find anything similarly here if we will say db.clients.find you shouldn't get anything so we can also insert multiple documents okay let me show you that quickly just make like this for time's sake Okay, so we have different documents. So we have db.clients. Instead of insert, we will use insert many. Okay, makes sense. We are going to insert the first document, the second document, and the third document. Okay, the same exact field. So we have ID, company address, overdue invoices, products, and creation date. Okay, and let's run that all right perfect so let's check that out okay so green mark means that everything went okay let's query that again db.clients.find and you can see below here that boom we have three documents with company name address creation date id everything is organized and neat and that's why I like really data grip. You can use data grip with other database systems such as MySQL or PostgreSQL. It's really great ID. And let's check out here the same thing. So we'll say database.clients.find. Okay, so take a look. 
beautiful three different documents all right so let's check out for instance the company where the overdue invoices are 21 okay so how might we do that we don't know for sure because we might have different documents so for example we might have 100 documents in the collection this is just for simplicity's sake but if I want to check out the over the companies with the overdue invoices of 21, for instance. So how might we do that? This is very easy. So we can choose document based on a criteria. In order to do that, we can say db.clients.find the same method, but inside we'll have an argument of for instance, the overdue invoices, which is equal to 21. So we will say overdue invoices set to 21. And this should be inside curly braces like that. All right. And there you go. Indeed, the client with the ID one has overdue invoices. So what's the name of that client? Vanilla factory. Okay, so this is how to pick a certain document from a collection of documents, all right, um, based on a certain criteria or something that you are looking for. And this is very similar to in SQL, for example, you would say something like select all from clients, clients table, where overdue invoices is equal to 21. For example, overdue invoices. All right, this is what would you do in SQL system. It's the same thing. So let me just comment this out. Similar to in SQL. All right. And I will leave this, I will, I will copy that guys and I will leave it in a sheet and I will keep it in GitHub. You can use that as a reference. You can also sort data by ascending or descending order. So what would you do simply is, so let's just add a comment here. So ascending or descending, descend, uh, descending order. just sorting right sorting by sending or descending order to do that is very simple you say db dot clients dot find and you want to access another method called sort so let's say for instance id zero oh yeah sorry for that um we use one for ascending or minus one for descending. I don't know why I have chosen two or just, I thought differently. So we can use one for ascending and minus one for descending. Okay, so you have descending because we used minus one and ascending because we used plus one or one. Zero, one, two, two, one, zero. Okay, I think Hope it will work. Yeah, it will work. So it's not always the fault of data grip. Okay, we can also, so here, ascending one, descending minus one. We can also update. There are two ways for updating some element inside your collection or your document. So the safe way, which is you can set exactly a criteria based on which you can update. And if you watched my farm stack course, I have used the set operator to update the to do item. So let's say for instance, that we want to update the overdue invoices instead of 22, we can say 40, for instance. So let's see what we can do about that. So here we can add a comment updating. So in order to update, we can use db.clients.update method. And I want my criteria, which is ID number two. I just make this like that. 
all right id is set to two comma then open curly braces and here i will use dollar sign set which is the operator to set or to update whatever i want so i want to update the overdue invoices i want to update it to 40 and let's see if i will add something so it's a field that it doesn't exist in the document but what if i will say importer i will give it a name of let's say james um, co limited for example let's see what will happen so ideally what should happen the 22 will be 40 and that new field will be added to the document so let's see what we can get query db.clients dot um, find and let's take a look so let's make this bigger so here we have let's check out id number two okay and there you go we have updated the overdue invoices from 22 to 40 and there is the importer as well so you see what we did the importer in both documents are unset while the importer in the second id is set to james co limited as we defined here all right so i hope this is clear for you guys let's say that we want to increment uh, vanilla factory overdue invoices from 21 to 50. so how might we do that so say incrementing um, we can take the db dot clients dot update and we want to update based on a criteria and the criteria here is id1 so we'll choose the company with the id1 and i want to increment so i will use dollar sign inc or short for increment and what i want to increment is the overdue invoices and i will increment it by right so let's run that okay successful let's check out again db.clients.find and let's take a look to the id number one okay and let's see we have 40 oh i think it's nine uh, 29 not 19 all right let's say that we want to increase this from 69 to 70 so we want to increment it by one so let's increment that by one and there you go 70. we can also rename stuff so we can rename a field or um, a key in the key value pair so instead for example of company in id1 we can say legal name so in order to do that we can take the db dot clients dot update set the criteria id1 and what i want to do is to have an operator rename and i want to rename the company and i want to set that to legal name okay so let's check that out db.clients.find and let's check out company we don't have something called company here but we have legal name which is set to vanilla factory the legal name is unset for both and is set for that vanilla factory um, i meant to say that this is milk i didn't say that this is sugar and coffee i don't know in the process we have changed this is maybe a bit confusing so let's actually work on that let's update uh, that la sosta company from milk and vanilla to sugar and coffee so let's do that so in order to do that we said that we can use db.clients so here i'm going to update update array in id zero so db.clients dot update and i want to choose the id one um id zero so you can do it like that with the um, set operator and we can set the product so we can have here um the 
products and the products I want to set them to sugar and coffee okay all right so let's run that okay perfect so let's see if we will query to display everything so let's see what we have for ID zero. And there you go. They're updated to sugar and coffee. All right, so these are some basic commands that you need to master in MongoDB. Certainly there are a lot more than that. Um, you can create indexes, you can uh, update embedded documents. All right, and in order to exit the shell, just type exit and you are out now let me show you the same thing in mongo compass so if you have mongo compass opened you can take a look you can hit refresh here so we have our new db so we have our clients so basically you have the same thing id0 id1 id2 with everything you have products um, array you can click on that arrow so yeah, this is basically it, guys. Um, let me show you the last thing in this course, how we can connect to the cloud. So go ahead and sign in. So the first thing you need to do before you build a cluster is you need to go to database access in order to create a new database user. So we can have a user, let's say, back brace and your password. All right, and here the password contains special characters. All right, never mind all of that. Uh, these are the privileges, so you can have um, total control, read and write to any database. Um, Atlas admin only read any database, so this is kind of limited, uh, limited control to read only. All right, but we want to have full control, so read and write. Click add user. Now the next step is to go to clusters build a cluster so here you have different choices um, this is the one that we're going to choose so this is shared clusters this is actually for development so this is very good for development but not for production so if you're learning mongodb and trying to create some applications uh, using mongodb database this might be your ideal choice you don't want to pay for extra bucks for something that you won't use really here you have dedicated clusters and this is the price and dedicated multi-cloud and multi-region clusters and it's uh, with a higher price okay but we are going to create a cluster with uh, this free tier that mongodb can give us you can choose your uh, cloud provider and region i usually use google cloud others can choose amazon web services or microsoft azure um here i'm next to belgium i'm in poland so use um, the server which is in belgium right so here you have a cluster tier with a shared dram and 512 megabytes of storage okay all of that's very good the cluster name you can rename your cluster so we can leave that as it is or we can change it we can say crash course okay and create cluster all right this is going to take some time says so from one to three minutes all right, so this took one minute or so. You can check out your collections. Um, we don't have any collections yet, okay? And you can load a sample data set. So here we have a sample data set for 350 megabytes. Uh, if you want, of course, you can load that and check it out. So let's see actually what they have. Available sample data set. So we have Airbnb, Geospatial, restaurants and so on weather um, so let's load sample data set actually and in the meantime let me show you if we want to connect so we have different methods of connection so you can click on connect so the first thing that you want to do is to add your current IP address I'm not going to do that you can add a different IP address or you can allow access from anywhere okay next you can choose a connection method 
So you have basically three ways to connect to your, uh, your cloud database. The first one through your Mongo shell, and you can take that string, copy it and paste it in the shell. Okay, of course, uh, with your username, which is backbrace here, and this is the crash course database, so you should be fine. The second way is to use it inside your application. So you connect to your application and you have the driver to choose from. So you have Node.js, we have Python, Perl, PHP, Ruby. Okay, of course, with your username and you will substitute the whole thing, okay, with your password. You can include that in your application or you can include full driver code example can take the whole thing, copy and paste it inside your code. Um, it will depend, of course, on the programming language. You can choose 3.6. Okay, using PyMongo. Alright, so PyMongo is a driver like motor. Um, and the third way is through your Mongo compass. Alright, so let's see if we can connect to the Mongo shell. Let's copy that. Let's go to our terminal. And that hit enter and enter your password that you have set for the user all right so now we are connected to the cloud um, let's try to show DBS so show DBS to check out all the databases that we have loaded from the data set uh, let's use for instance sample Airbnb. So this is in the cloud, guys, right? We are connected to MongoDB server. Uh, switch to DB sample Airbnb. We can say show collections. All right. Listing and reviews. So let's check out everything in listings and reviews. So we can say DB dot listings and reviews dot find basically everything that we have used locally we can use on the cloud it's the same you hit enter and you have a lot of data there is a method called dot pretty to make everything pretty all right so still a lot but at least treatable right we have here what do we have here so these are the reviews Ben's apartment is situated among trendy cafes and bars. All right, that's very nice. You can play with all of that. All right, so I hope this was useful to you guys and it gave you a glimpse on what MongoDB can do and what you can do with MongoDB actually. The installation, the queries, everything about MongoDB, I hope that I have covered. Of course, I didn't cover everything in the queries and commands. There are a lot of commands that you can discover. The documentation of MongoDB is amazing. And again, I recommend that you create one or two applications using MongoDB and keep them in your portfolio. So thank you very much for watching, guys, and I will see you in the next video. Take it easy.